Okay, so I was told that if I walk around, they uh, won't be able to follow me on the video. So my <laughs> gift to those on video is I'm going to walk around so you won't have to look at me. Okay, so that's my gift to you. Uh, those in the room, I'm sorry, I would hide or do something, but, uh, you know, so be it. So first off, I wanted to introduce a few folks. I think most of you who've ever been to an industry day at DISA have seen me and heard me and all that. But there are some new faces in the group that uh, popped up on the reorg chart this morning that the boss showed that I wanted to uh, get up here on the podium and let you get some face recognition. So first off, Mr. John Hickey. John, if you would stand up, turn around, get on camera, say hello. John is the new authorizing official, also known as DAA. So he'll be taking up that uh, responsibility and cleaning up a lot of the mess that I've created over the last couple of years. Uh, the next new addition to the team is Mr. David Stickley. He is uh, the vice PO for Mission Assurance. Or well, The titles are still under construction. I think the boss talked, said that. I hope he did. But titles are not important necessarily. Uh, the work is what's important. But Mr. Stickley is leading uh, right beside Mr. Keeley, who unfortunately couldn't make it this afternoon, uh, the delivery of cyber capabilities. I know the boss pointed out that's one of his key priorities. So Mr. Stickley, Mr. Keeley, that's the team that's going to be carrying that forward and again cleaning up much of the mess I've created over the years uh, in the cyber defense capability area. Next new addition is Mr. Pete Dinsmore. Pete, stand up, please. <laughs> Pete is the uh, DCTO for Mission Assurance. So he's the brains behind the rest of us, actually figuring out how we solve cyber defense problems and what we should be doing next as we work through the security architecture and coming up with the innovations and solutions. Okay. So once we get to the questions and answer portion, if you have hard questions, I'm going to be leaning on my new uh, battle buddies to try to get you accurate, meaningful answers, OK? All right, let's go to the next slide. So I think this is somewhat consistent across the years. I always like, in talking with industry, to frame the discussion with a description of what problem is it we are actually trying to solve as opposed to saying, when is the next RFP going to hit the streets, OK? Because I think it is important that we have that broad understanding of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to fix, so that you can interpret RFIs and RFPs and see the higher level commander's intent, objective, problem statement, et cetera. So that's what I've got here. And uh, these, this slide is composed of information it's a little bit in the small print, so I'll read it to you. It's composed of information from the JIE ICD. Uh, what does ICD stand for? Come on, brains. Initial capability document. The GIG 2.0 ICD and the Cyber Situational Awareness ICD. So these are all documents that were created outside of DISA by joint staff, Cyber Command, DOD CIO, to try to describe what problem we should all be working on, as well as the JIE Ops ConOps and the, the uh, Chairman's white paper on JIE. So I really like this slide. I really like it, not because it's a neat slide, but because it helps articulate and clarify what we really are trying to get after to improve the defenses within the Department of Defense. Okay, the cyber defenses within the Department of Defense. And one of the key themes that comes out in this slide is that it is really not talking about technology per se. It's not saying we don't have an adequate firewall or we don't have a tank that can go a certain speed or project a certain distance. It's talking about enterprise defense of the cyber battle space across the Department of Defense. And if you read through the, the details on this slide, almost every one of them talks about the gap that's created by having stovepipe efforts, all good, 
all well-intentioned, all effective in their own right, but stovepipe efforts by the services, the agencies, the combatant commands that lead us, leave us without the visibility that we need to adequately defend across the entire enterprise. Okay? Does that make sense? So that to me says, DISA, you need to step it up a notch because this is all about enterprise capabilities. It's all about joint. It's all about pulling together the equities, interests, capabilities of the services to deliver enterprise solutions. So I see this slide as a tremendous challenge for us as an agency. Now, there are those who interpret this, and i be honest, I was one of them until uh, I got my mind right, that this should do more of this actual cyber defense work and that we should solve the problems for the services. Now I think that's really the wrong idea, the wrong concept, but that we should be right there in partnership with the services so that we leverage their capabilities, we enable them with some enterprise solutions, but we certainly do not want to disenfranchise the services or imply that DISA is going to take over and do all that cyber defense stuff for everybody. Okay? So as you see the next two slides, they will try to reinforce this message that as we get enterprise level views, as we get standardized security topologies, as we reduce the avenues attack, all that is done in a way that gives the services the ability to execute their defense, cyber defense responsibilities. And we're building that completely in partnership with the military services. Okay? Now, one of the things that's come up, and I'll just say it right here uh, to get in front of it. I could have probably put it anywhere in the, in the briefing, but I'll just get it right up front, is the, co the, the comment that are you putting too much dependence on an enterprise approach, a single security architecture, so now you've got a single point of failure. Okay? That's definitely a concern that was well thought out and considered as we built the strategy, built the architecture, and proceeded with the acquisitions. So if you look at the approach, the way I characterize the previous approach, we sort of got some diversity just by random activities and maybe the chaos theory that, you know, if everybody just goes out and does their thing, you're going to end up with some randomness, okay? But what we are doing now is we're designing technology diversity into the architecture, designing it so that we have reinforcing capabilities and ensuring that those capabilities reinforce the, themselves in a logical, effective way, but do that in a way that gives us that enterprise level view where the legacy approach, it says, everybody just go off and meet a security guide, do it however you see fit, but do it in isolation, creates those pockets that adversaries can work within and then become, uh, effect, they become effective in exploiting and attacking against the Department of, of Defense. Okay? Next slide. So busy slide, I apologize for that, but it really emphasizes a few, just a very few core co uh, concepts. And one is that we have some enterprise level boundary defenses. On this slide, this one is really focusing on the unclassified network as an example, but there's a companion slide on the uh, classified side that talks about how we have the companion set of enterprise level boundary defenses. That gives us the opportunity to mitigate a number of threats effectively with one op center executing countermeasures, monitoring and managing the, those devices, that set of technology at key points in the network. Right behind that, we have the regional security approach where everybody's heard JRSS. That's the main effort that we've got ongoing this year, next year, and possibly extending on beyond that. That, again, enables the services, enables the services to do their cyber defense responsibilities, execute their responsibilities with a standard solution that's operated and maintained by DISA, but run by the military services. So we'll take care of the health and welfare. 
We'll keep it alive. We'll patch it. We'll maintain it. But the policies, the configurations, the management, the cyber defense activities will be done by the military services leveraging that platform. We're able to put in a lot of, lot of high-tech, latest technology into that regional stack that you couldn't afford to do at the 17, what's our latest number, 1,700? 1,700 points of light that you, we have tried to do before. Uh, so it gives us an advantage in terms of how we can approach that regional layer of security. Uh, don't have any details on this slide, but another key defense point is the core data center where we have a security architecture in place today that will evolve over time that puts the appropriate level of protections at the, at the host and the boundary for the critical applications supporting the Department of Defense. Before I go to the enclave, I wanted to point out a new addition to the concept, and that's this commercial cloud off to the side for levels three through five. And uh, I know if you're in that cloud security business, you probably are painfully familiar with the level one, two, three, five, six, all that kind of stuff. Three through five is the sensitive but unclassified work that we are uh, trying to find the appropriate way to put at least a set of it into a commercial cloud, either on-premise or off-premise. What we're showing here is how we are leveraging a virtual slice of the joint regional security stack to give us the protections and visibility that we need for the workload that goes into that commercial cloud. P core part of where we're going, very important strategic direction for us and for the Department of Defense. And I'll probably get a question or two, I suspect, on that. Uh, <laughs> we get to that point. Enclave and endpoint. So the military services run the endpoints, the military services run the enclaves, but we provide some enterprise level capabilities to help them, help empower them and enable them to do that function. Uh, one of the things, and you'll see this in red here, um, is host-based security system, HBSS. We're approaching on the end of life of that contract vehicle and one of the top priorities for Pete Dinsmore, you feel that buzz rolling over your back? Okay, that's me, yeah. Uh, is to figure out the strategy for the next generation of endpoint defenses, okay? At this point, I'm not sure we even have a strategy to get a strategy. But that is uh, one of the things Pete is absolutely focused on to change the dynamics of what the department must accomplish versus what an adversary must, is able to do to get an advantage. The, uh, the balance of power is in the wrong direction. It's definitely an asymmetric battle right now with us having to get it all right all the time everywhere or pretty darn close to that and them just having to find a point of presence that they could get a, a foothold and then they spread and have a, a broad ability to do damage. So Pete's, uh, Pete's focus is to come up with a new strategy that will then lead to an acquisition strategy, but it will be focused on coming up with a more effective and more efficient and more consistently executable approach to defending the endpoints. Did I get that about right, Pete? You got it solved yet? Another hour. Okay, I don't know why you're sitting here. And you're, I don't know how that one worked out. I'm gonna talk about the cyber SA piece on the next slide, so I'll skip that here. The color coding uh, hopefully aligns to your handouts that I guess were downstairs or somewhere uh, that give you the specifics about what specific contract activity is uh, intended on each one of those uh, green shaded activities. And then the red being the big um, re-engineering new solution opportunity that, that uh, Pete is working on as we speak. Let's see. One last thing I slept off of this slide is uh, mobile device manager. As I think everyone knows, one of our major efforts uh, recently was uh, to get an enterprise MDM in place. That already is up for a recompete, so that will be coming out on the streets here shortly as well. And one of the things that's aligned to that is Pete's effort to look at endpoints because I kind of think of my iPad as an endpoint. Even though we have a different strategy for securing iPads and Androids, 
than we do for Windows desktops. So part of what Pete's looking at is should that be a single endpoint uh, protection defense uh, strategy. Okay, next slide. I'm trying to make sure that most of the questions go to Pete, not Mark. <laughs> I'm noticing. Okay, all right, how am I doing? So uh, cyber situational awareness analytic plan. You know, we talk a lot about JRSS, Joint Regional Security Stack, but I really think that this analytic cloud should be and is the most important activity that we have on our plate right now. JRSS is a great concept. It will provide advanced capabilities. It will be more efficient. It's a great, great step forward, but really only if we have the analytics to go with it only if we have the analytics to go with it. Because the cyber defense workforce has got to be able to see what's going on on the network to know how to leverage and apply those countermeasures and the capabilities that are provided by the joint regional security stack. Static defenses without analytics are not going to work. They're not going to be effective. We've got to have the analytic platform to go with it. We had a session off at Fort Huachuca hosted by uh, Mr. Krieger, our very best partner in this effort our very best partner, uh, Mr. John, uh, Mike Krieger. And what one of the groups went off and worked through a whole array of cyber use cases, talking about various threat activities, and said, how do we identify that threat and how do we counter that threat? It was a pretty interesting group. All pros at actually doing this for a living. And what came out of every single use case was that JRSS by itself would not provide the visibility needed to actively engage with that threat scenario. JRSS, enriched by data from the internet access points and enriched by data from the core data centers and enriched by data from the enclaves and endpoints, HBSS, then gives you that visibility that you need to see the threat activity and get in front of it, contain it, stop it, engage with the offensive, that's, uh, that's part of the scenario. But it gives you all of the visibility that you need to be effective, where JRSS is just a piece, important piece, but just a piece of that lar larger cyber situational awareness that's really the, the most important message. So one of the things I wanted to highlight is CSAC is not big data analytics. CSAC includes big data analytics, but our cyber situational awareness analytic cloud is intended to be capability focused, leveraging the appropriate technology to achieve the effects. Okay? So we talk about the big data analytics, because that's kind of sexy, it's in the press, everybody likes to talk about big data. It's important advancement in the analytic cloud, but we've also got some great commercial technology that is not going to go away. It might be tech refreshed and recompeted, but we're going to continue to leverage commercial technology where that's the best solution. We also have some you know, traditional structured database components where sometimes that's just the best way to deliver a capability. Bottom line is it's all about the cyber workforce. It's all about delivering them the capabilities they need to see and defend the DOD networks. And by the way, when I talk about the cyber workforce, I'm using it in the, the broader sense where we have the cyber operators that do the operating defense 24 by 7, as well as the emerging cyber protection teams. So if, you, if, if you're a cyber protection team coming into uh, FOC, I see this as your major weapon system, as the place that you can go to hunt and see what's going on on the network, find out what needs to be done, and then execute countermeasures as appropriate, leveraging the technology across the, uh, the entire spectrum. Okay? Not saying that's their only toolkit, but I do see cyber protection teams as uh, probably priority one user, user of the analytic cloud right side by side with the cyber defense operators and uh, 
the core workforce that you see in DISA every day, and the services. Sorry, I was guilty of leaving the services out. I should listen to my own presentations every once in a while, right? Okay, so that's the slide portion. I think that's the last slide, right? Yeah. And the intent was to have plenty of time for questions uh, uh, of Pete and, uh, <laughs> and Stick. So now is your opportunity to put them on the spot, or, or me if you have any easy questions, okay? Have I effectively stayed out of view of the camera? Hello, Mark. This is Bernard Durham from Linquest. Uh, earlier we heard a presentation from Jesse Showers that referenced to OSS. How do you see the OSS feeding into the architecture you just presented? Yeah. So uh, let's go back uh, one slide, and then we'll go back two slides. Okay, whoops, let's go there here first. So the OSS is part of the data source down here for the uh, core data centers. There's a support system there. There's a core uh, support system that Jesse talked about that manages the IPs and the DISN. So that's a key data source coming into the analytic cloud. And that really gives us the enterprise service status piece primarily, but also some key data for some of the other functional uh, capabilities inside of the analytic cloud. We use that today as a core source of data for uh, managing enterprise email, for example. Okay, let's go back to the next slide. I mean, previous slide. So inside this bubble here, Enterprise Operations Center, the tools that they use to actually configure, manage, and maintain the backbone enterprise and the core data center is that OSS suite of tools uh, that, that basically gives the enterprise operation centers the wrenches and screwdrivers that they need to do the day-to-day -day tasks. Is that? Okay, next question. Mr. Orndorff, I have one from the virtual audience. What is DISA's position on using vendor proprietary protocols that eliminate others from competing for emerging opportunities across JIE, JRSS? Okay. <laughs> when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> okay. So what is our position on doing bad things? We shouldn't do bad things. <laughs> we're, we're opposed to that. Uh, vendor proprietary protocols and eliminating competition. You know, obviously, we try to avoid doing that. Uh, I do think there are situations where we've got to innovate in ways that it, where we accept some comp we make some compromises with a vision then to get away from that over the long term. Um, I'd kind of be interested in some specific examples where we've done that that's really inhibited competition because I think in most cases, if we do something like that, it's because there is no competition, right? And if we have done that, or uh, you see us heading down that direction, I would say first off, engage in the RFI uh, process and let us know if you see us heading down that path before we get there. And then if we are already there, and you see where we've done something that's inhibiting competition, you let uh, Stick or Bill know that we've done that and we need to relook at our, our strategy. Okay, next question. No more questions, yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, Eric Lewis with Proofpoint. Do you envision uh, some of the capabilities that are involved here, you know, with the rest of, of DISA moving more towards cloud, do you envision some of these security capabilities, maybe at the IAPs or other places, actually leveraging commercial cloud capability? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, we had an RFI out on the street where we got some pretty exciting responses back that talk about opportunities of how we might be able to do exactly that. So we're in the process right now of reviewing those responses and trying to make sure that the acquisition strategy is open enough to allow for comp competition that includes those options um, as at least an option for consideration. 
Uh, stick, anything you want to add to, to that? No? Okay. No, but I, I did want to use that sort of as a, 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 leap, a launching point to highlight the importance of the RFI responses. Uh, a lot of people over the years have told me they read an RFI to try to figure out what it is we want so then they can tell us what we want to hear. And that really isn't what we want. What we want is information to help us go in the, direction, the right direction and to tell you what we're thinking so that you can help us adjust if we're not thinking about the problem the right way. So I think some of you have done a great job of telling us, hey, try a different idea. Here's a different thought for you to consider. Others have had that, and you talk about it behind our backs, but talk about us in front of our face. That's what RFIs are all about. So I would just ask you to be open and frank if you see us, not insulting, okay? <laughs> open and frank if you see us not thinking about the problem in the right way, and use the RFIs as an opportunity to help us uh, take a broader perspective. Another example of that, by the way, is EMAS. Uh, we're going to be doing the EMAS follow-on. We tried this last time where the acquisition strategy was trying to fairly compete COTS against GOTS strategies. So you could bid whichever one you want. Uh, when we did sort of the after-action assessment, it, it did, it, I think the feedback from industry and the feedback from my own team was it wasn't as level a playing field as we would have liked it to be for a number of reasons, having tried it for the very first time. We're going to try it again, and as you see the RFI and the RFP, please watch for that to make sure that we are looking at it properly to allow COTS and GOTS to compete. Because we are not, we really are not settled on one strategy versus the other. We want to have both on the table and let them compete head to head. Okay? That's kind of a tangent from your question, but there you go. Okay. Anything else? Somebody, the microphone? Yeah, Mark, how are you today? Good. You look good. Uh, Two-part two question, actually. One, what is your collaboration piece with the IC right now? I know you're doing a lot of work with NSA and others, but uh, can you go into a little bit of detail on what you're doing to kind of cross-utilize capabilities, because they have some that you don't and so on. And then second part, of that mix of things you have up there, what is a basic split between services and then product, hardware, software? Okay. Pete, is there anything at all that we can say to the first question? Uh, we do work well with them yeah. in ways that we aren't going to talk about here. Okay. Uh, I, I think, you know, if you just look at roles and responsibilities, it's pretty obvious. We are trying to leverage commercial technology to address the threats and provide the platform that commercial technology is best suited to address. They, uh, our intelligence community partners, are doing the nation state to nation state attack scenarios that leverage things that commercial technology is not necessarily uh, able to address. So that partnership is, is very tight. We work incredibly well together, I think. And uh, some of these capabilities are an integration of both. I just, I think I probably said as much as can be said. And, yeah. I mean, as an example, I just came from there this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So I was lucky to see Pete today. He's spent so much time over there. But. Okay, was there a part two to the question? Yeah, it was a mix of services and products. Yeah, so the green shaded work is uh, primarily the service side. Right, Chip? And then uh, the host-based security system, actually, we, with the exception of JRSS, I think we, yeah. Uh, with the exception of JRSS will be a capability. HBSS next generation, or I don't think we're even going to, we're going to disassociate it from that name just to make sure that nobody is thinking that we want another of what we have. Uh, but the replacement for HBSS is a capability. Joint regional stack is a capability. Um, the rest of these are primarily service offerings. Did I miss any, Chip? Okay. Sir, so from our virtual audience, will the new HBSS use GOTS integrated tools with COTS as it is today? 
Well, if I were replying to the RFI, I would look at the requirement and say, what's the best solution? And if it was GOTS and COTS or all of one or none of the other, you know, I would offer that up as part of an RFI response. But uh, I do not want to be dictating and ans answering that question because that's counter to the conversation that we want to have. Okay? All right. I'm glad they asked that question just so I could say that I won't answer it. <laughs> we still have a few more from the virtual okay. audience. Do DISA organizations follow the federal CIO's digital playbook when planning and building digital services, whether those services are public facing, industry facing, or DOD facing? Okay, so we're all looking a little, con all, my, all my backup guys have the same <laughs> look that I have. Uh, huh? Yeah, I haven't heard that term, so I think. It's probably a term issue. Uh, we certainly are aligned with FedRAMP. We're aligned with all of the NIST publications and standards, and we're leveraging that uh, to the absolute maximum extent, more than we ever have in history. Uh, the term playbook has got us a little bit stumped up here, but, uh, you know, what's the expression we'll call a, yeah. huh? Lifeline. Lifeline, lifeline, yeah. Okay, we'll figure this out when we get home. But uh, as it stands right now, what I can say for sure is we are leveraging FedRAMP on, as, as the absolute core and foundation for everything we're doing on the commercial cloud. From a, a accreditation authorization standpoint, we're totally aligned with uh, the standards that come out of NIST. And uh, you know, I think mobility, we're, we're, we're leveraging that as well. Playbook stumped me though. Next question. All right. How will you create appropriate threat indicators, policies, or rule sets on the enterprise seams listed in COTS components without a comprehensive threat intelligence platform? Okay, so that assumes we don't have a comprehensive threat intelligence platform, which I basically reject that assumption. So I think we have an organization down the street that provides a pretty good uh, capability, maybe world-class even, uh, threat intelligence uh, capability. So I think the assumption is wrong. Is it, was it a product-based question? It might have been a product-based question because there are products that use threat clouds to okay. share information. Okay. Yeah, so that is... Uh, as an area, because we have the partnership with the NSA, we haven't invested money in buying a commercial service to, to augment what we get from our intelligence community. I know that topic comes up frequently, and it's really a cut line issue. Not that there's no value, but if you have the best intelligence organization in the world, you kind of feel like maybe that's not the biggest gap that you've got in, uh, in capabilities. My son works there, by the way. <laughs> I know they're the best. Okay, next question. Any more? Uh, yes, sir. Wait, we gotta wait for a mic. Well, I don't know if I need a mic. I can well, there's paper. people out in video land or something that would be deprived of your wisdom if we didn't bring the mic. <laughs> just, sir? I wanted to ask about the insider threat. Without okay. getting into details, do you feel like you made progress on uh, keeping track of that one? Okay. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I, I meant to have that in my speaking uh, notes, but since I don't use notes, I forgot it. Um, the analytic cloud, one of the priority efforts inside of that analytic cloud is addressing the insider threat. And uh, again, without getting into the absolute specifics of it, the guys working this have come up with some amazing, amazingly scary, but amazing products that help us see uh, through the data sources that we have here, here, and here, where we have indicators of potential insider threat activity. The stuff is just flat amazing. And the, their ability to spin and pivot on information is really impressive. Um, 
I'll just give you a quick example because I think we do have a couple more minutes, right? Am I doing okay on time? Yeah. Uh, they showed me one day, I think it was, Dan, uh, was it Tuesday, I think. They showed me how they could see across the SIPR net where there seemed to be an anomalous amount of information going into a single point. Okay? Anybody remember Private Manning? Right. And then they showed me how there was unusual hour use of removable media at points in the network. Okay? So, well, do we have any of those two things happening in the same place? Well, nobody asked us that before. Come back on Thursday, and they had a new analytic dropped into the cloud that brought those two together and, and showed how you can take questions that somebody comes up with by seeing an insider threat analytic on one day and two days later have a whole new analytic that answers a question that had never been asked before. Not that that was the hardest question or the most sophisticated insight or anything, but I think it shows the power of the engine and the power of the data sources that we have available to us to get in front of insider threat. I know you all have heard me previous years say, as far as insider threat goes, my view is we don't need more technology out there scattered around the network. What we need right now are the analytics to leverage the data that we already have available to us. And then once we hit a gap, we'll deal with it. But let's use the data we have, build the analytics, and there's a hell of a lot we can do to get in front of insider threat right now with the capabilities already on the ground, okay? I don't know how I left this off, the uh, list, but another analytic thread is uh, cross-domain. And we have those analytics already in place, again, to get after the, whether it's, you call it insider threat or just protection of classified information is sort of the title I prefer to use, but uh, even though the rest of the world likes insider threat, so on my charts I use their word, not mine. But, uh, you know, how do we protect the confidentiality of our classified information? Uh, we've got some great cross-domain capabilities as well. Did that cover it? Great. Any other questions? So we've got one more that's being written right now. It's being written. Pause. We've got one over here that's already written. It's not written. Oh, you got to um, write it first, sorry. Sir, you, you talked about uh, commercial cloud connecting yeah. to the Joint Regional yeah. Security Stack. Can you talk about how you're working with the services to identify candidate applications for sensitive but unclassified to leverage that commercial cloud capability? Yeah. So uh, it's an ongoing process. Mr. Halverson uh, is personally interested in driving that effort. We've, uh, in partnership with the services, we have five candidates already identified for pilot activity that is working over the next uh, several weeks. Only one of those is a DISA system. Uh, the other four came from the services, I guess one from an agency, is that right, Pete? Anyway, non-DISA, spread across, not a single service, but we've got that working. Um, what Mr. Halverson tasks us to do uh, as a result of some not necessarily positive feedback, but constructive feedback on the uh, cloud security model was to update that in a way that industry can understand better what they need to do, and also make it easier, by the way, and then make it easier to understand on the government side how to understand what cloud service uh, options are appropriate for the various missions, system requirements, et cetera. Um, like I told somebody a few minutes ago, for people like me that are in the security business, the thing is perfectly easy to understand, okay? I, I read it, it's all the terms that I live with every day, but people that live out there in the real world uh, had a little bit of trouble understanding exactly what we were trying to say. So we're trying to do an English language translation we brought in some English experts to figure out how to translate from our words to theirs. And uh, part of what we're doing now is to come up with a better message to communicate so that system owners across the department would know how to leverage commercial cloud, where that's appropriate, what the risk acceptance decisions are, and then also better articulate to industry uh, what, what they need to do. Did that cover your question?
the five pilots will help us a lot in answering a number of different questions. Okay, uh, that being one of them. So we've got about two minutes. If you have time for one more. As DISA and the services issue JIE contracts, is DISA coordinating with their IC program partners? It seems that JIE and iSight have multiple layers of comparable requirements. Is DISA and IC coordinating to leverage progress of the other? Yeah, so under the broad banner of JIE contracts, I think other people have answered the question about is JIE a program and what are JIE contracts. So I won't try to rehash that ground. Uh, in terms of the single security architecture and cyber capabilities um, subset of what contracts are underway to provide uh, capabilities under the JIE framework. I get the right? Yeah. Uh, we are absolutely partnered with the intelligence community. For example, you look in that analytic cloud, that big data platform, that set of open source, primarily open source technology is inherited from the intelligence community. We had to add to it a little bit for some things that we couldn't replicate at the secret and unclassified level, but the foundation is what we inherited and adopted from the intelligence community. As you work across the security architecture, they use HBSS because they got it from us and they're leveraging the technology that we provided. There are some areas where we're, we're evaluating and comparing notes and then making conscious decisions that we, we have a reason to do something slightly differently. Uh, but we are, I think, consistently working together and sharing our notes and coming up with common approaches whenever, uh, whenever possible. You know, their commercial cloud strategy, CIA effort in particular, where they brought the on-premise commercial cloud is absolutely one that we are uh, working with and trying to learn from so that we leverage and build off of their experience, not start, start over from scratch. Okay. I'm out of time? I'm out of time. Okay. You guys got off easy. I, even my best effort to try to set them up for hard questions failed.